Welcome to the Boardroom Sessions podcast. In these sessions, we meet the most amazing and interesting people. We learn about their passions, their business models, cool new technologies, and of course, their lessons on personal growth. I hope you enjoy. In this Boardroom Sessions podcast, we meet Danny Nichols, a personal hero of mine. I'm so excited to share this interview with everyone. Um, it was a difficult interview in the fact that Danny is very humble, and it's really hard for me to get across the level of which um, this guy is impacting other people's lives, the, the distance and lengths of which he'll go to help other individuals, the network of which he has of people that will try and help him help other people. When he calls, people answer. Um, things happen and uh, this guy is just an incredible giver and an incredible badass at that. Ex-pro surfer, uh, father, husband, um, lots of other monikers. We go through this here. Um, uh, talk about a successful business at Inkright. Uh, we talk about uh, the operation Open Water, his uh, pet project now and um, philanthropy that I'm a part of and excited to share with you. Hope you enjoy. Danny Nichols, welcome to the Boardroom Sessions podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Hey, so Danny, um, let me give you a few uh, few information, a little bit of information here for the folks that are watching uh, or listening. Um, we are sitting here right now at the Newport Aquatic Center in Newport Beach. Uh, we're in your Sprinter van, which is configured like an office and uh, pretty sweet, by the way. We just had a, a board meeting in here for the uh, open water um, charity, which we're going to talk about here. Um, but we're sitting with the view of the beach and uh, people hear uh, an airplane or two cross over. You'll know that we're under the John Wayne Airport um, takeoff zone here in Newport Beach. But uh, here we are sitting in Danny's van having a conversation around uh, around the Boardroom Sessions podcast. Yeah, let's do this. All right. So, Danny, a few, few things. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of descriptors that uh, I would describe you as. So, one, ex-pro surfer, surf coach philanthropist, entrepreneur, father, husband, and every day, good old guy. Everybody I know that knows Danny has a bright smile as soon as they uh, they hear about you. So those are a few monikers that I have. Um, anything else I'm missing? Jeez. No. Wow. You're also humble <laughs> and understated. And so some of those things uh, are, are what, what make you make you the guy that you are today. But um, Danny, we're going to talk about a couple things here today. I want to I want to dive into a little bit of details about uh, open water, um, and I want to go into some details about uh, your business. And um, uh, more importantly, I want to start off the conversation with telling you, uh, telling the folks here on the on the podcast, what I think is. Um, your biggest moniker, if you will, um, is that you are on the Dead Board Riders uh, team for Huntington Beach. And so why don't you explain to everybody here what what the Board Riders uh, are and uh, the group is and what it does and, and how elite it is. Uh, the West Coast Board Riders Club. Actually, it's the U.S. Board Riders Club now, and there's an East Coast and a West Coast, which is really cool. Um, without going too much into the history of it, um, you know, the, the board riders have been around for a number of years. Australia has been doing this at a really high level. And um, Casey Wheat, Chris Moreno, uh, Ziggy Williams, and a, and a handful of uh, HB locals um, wanted to bring it back, right? And uh, and so brought it back, just kind of kicked it off grassroots um, probably six six or seven years ago now. I, I might not have my, my dates totally right but um started off real small it was kind of you know newport and huntington and, so and surf beach yeah right? surf competition it's a it's club it's club competition um age divisions you got 14 and under 15 and 19 20s 30s 40s uh 50s and girls uh and it's an opportunity to bring the community together um compete in a board riders club fashion tag team four people per age division and uh and his bragging rights um that's the competition side of it the community side of it is um this wonderful um mentorship opportunity of you know the older generations being able to mentor the younger generations and that was one of the things that really 
um, just attracted me because, uh, you know, I come from Huntington beach. Um, you know, I'm a second generation, um, Huntington beach guy. And I was raised by the generations that were older than me, you know? And so there's a high level of respect there and, um, and gratitude to the, for those that came before me and, uh, having this, um, board riders club, um, you know, competition and, and community structure is really cool because it, uh, it does, it brings everybody together from the fifties all the way down to our super groms that are like nine, 10 years old. Uh, and there's just this natural mentorship aspect to it, uh, which is really neat. But this is a bunch of surfers that are the elite of the elite, right? So in Huntington beach, for example, we have, um, consistently put in multiple pros that are on the tour that are traveling around from our town. We have one of the biggest surf contests in the world in our town, and you are on the team that is competing against all the other cities that also have equal folks like that, like San Diego, San Clemente, uh, um, where else? Like uh, Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz yeah. right? And so some of the pros that are in these, um, in these board riders are... L- some of the icons of all of surfing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's true. Um, gosh, you know, it is Huntington beach is really special. I mean, look on, on paper, we are surf city, right? Um, we have a heritage, um, around surfing and even though we are a big city, it's a very small town vibe and, um, you know, surfing is kind of at the epicenter of that. Um, and we have a rich history of, you know, top level surfers that have, um, you know, made it big on the, on, on tour or as a professional surfer to running companies, um, uh, in the action sports industry. Uh, and so it's definitely a breeding ground of talent all the way across the board. And, uh, there's also a lot of love here. This is a huge community element and, um, an opportunity to, to really kind of give back and pay the way for, um, you know, f- the future of Huntington Beach through the board riders. There are, uh, every one of those towns has a handful of uh, folks that were named, you know, name brands, if you will. They were pros, they were, you know, people know them and they're competing. And so Danny's being a little humble here and the fact that this is a big deal. I'll give you an example. I was down at the beach uh, a couple of weeks ago at a pro event and um, a friend of ours, Jay Larson, who was also on the board riders team from Huntington, uh, was wearing his windbreaker jacket. And uh, I watched a laundry list of competitive pro surfers walk by Jay and finger his jacket and say, oh, Jay, what do I need to get one of these? And so it's a coveted spot. It's a competitive spot. And uh, Danny is not only an athlete, but a coach and uh, a board member and all that kind of fun stuff on the board rider. So I just wanted to give you some accolades there. I don't know if that translates to everybody else, but in my world, you're a big deal. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm fortunate to be a board member for the Huntington Beach Board Riders Club. Um, I'm f- blessed to be able to help coach our West Coast Board Rider Club contest uh, and still be good enough to make it on the, uh, the 40s roster. Uh, the competition's pretty stiff. You mentioned Jay Larson. Um, Jay was a a huge mentor of mine growing up and, um, you know, still is today. Um, when I was starting to cut my teeth in surfing and first turned pro, um, he reeled me in and said, Hey man, there's, there's a certain way to do this. Stay close. Um, he coached and guided you. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to dive. I'm sure we'll dive into it later, but yeah, I kind of, I kind of went on tour, um, without a lot of structure. And so it was nice to have somebody like Jay kind of just, you know, provide some bumpers and, um, you know, show me the way. And if anybody wants to little, learn a little more about Jay Larson, we interviewed Jay on the Boardroom Sessions podcast on a previous episode. So go check out Jay yeah. Larson on the Boardroom Sessions podcast. But um, Danny, we're going to get into some good uh, stuff around business and uh, philanthropy here in a minute. But why don't you give us a little background on, uh, on you and how you got into pro surfing and um, where that trajectory took you here? Yeah. Um, well, I grew up in Huntington Beach, like I said, second generation. Uh, my mom, my aunts, my uncles, they all grew up here. Uh, mom was, uh, you know, this 
hippie, hung out with surfers. And when uh, I was old enough to start surfing, I started longboarding. I was part of the uh, Huntington Beach longboard crew. Uh, used to post up down there on Northside at Wind and Sea all the time. Surfed Northside, grew up there. Interesting, you were a longboarder first. Yes, and I actually didn't start riding a shortboard until um, my junior year in high school. My first day of high school, uh, I showed up to surf class, Huntington High. Andy Verdone was standing there with uh, you know all the surf team kids, and I rolled up with a longboard. And he just looked at me, told me to set the board down, looked at it from you know tail to nose, and just said, "Where does the sail go? Don't come back until you have a shortboard." And all the surf team kids like laughed and, and uh, it was a, it was a pretty tough moment. Um, it was really insecure. And for the listeners, there is a pro longboard division and there's a pro shortboard division too. They're two totally different yeah. uh, it's sports, right? Yeah. Uh, and so for the for my freshman and sophomore year, I really kind of battled with all the kids in surf class and on the surf team because I was a longboarder. But I grew up on north side. And so I was very comfortable. And so there wasn't, they weren't pushing me around very much because of my roots. Um, but my junior year in high school, Andy, you know, um, uh, was able to help me get a, a shortboard. My grandma helped buy a shortboard. Um, I got on a shortboard. I made the team. And then my senior year, I was captain of the surf team, co-captain with Matt Shabolt. That's a big deal for, for HB. Yeah, and then I, gradu- I graduated high school and uh, made the uh, OP Pro Junior Final um, against uh, Taj Burrow, Andy Irons, and CJ Hobgood. And uh, I got fourth in that final, <laughs> respectively. Yeah. Um, but then I turned pro. Uh, it all just kind of happened really quick. And, um, you know, at that point in my life, um, I was kind of bouncing in and out of friends' houses family's houses and um didn't have a whole lot of structure and um started dating my now wife um Aaron and um was very fortunate to find some structure early in life with that relationship but yeah I turned pro and I started to traveling and um I had no idea about money or any of those things and that like that again that's where like Jay Larson came in and was like all right tours could have people to show you around um yeah and so that was uh that was really cool it was, it was a pretty fast track on the surfing side of things um and uh when I was 24 Aaron had graduated college and um you know, we wanted to get married and I didn't want to be, you know, 30 years old and kind of hanging up a surf career and looking for a job and so I, I was riding for Billabong at the time and um, Ron Gould, who was the LA County rep, I had done a, um, some promotional stuff with him and um, he really liked my attitude around those promotional events and not to jump around, but I was a product of Huntington Surf and Sport. Um, I, I, I worked at Huntington Surf and Sport when I was 18 and through my surfing career, when I was home, I was working there. And I learned the value of customer service and uh, really like ingrained the core values of Huntington Surf and Sport in my life, you know, and the customer is gold. For the listeners, Huntington Surf and Sport is an iconic um, business in Huntington Beach. It's right there on the end of the pier, uh, Main Street and PCH. And uh, it's been there for since the 60s and has been a uh, a icon in the area. It's a very, very large company. consumer retail establishment with multiple locations throughout the city but the main main one right there in, in prime time yeah and and it really was the harvard of our surf industry because so many people who had worked there had gone on to become executives in the surf industry and really the action sports industry um, and a lot of companies that became really successful um, got their start there you know, if you made it into Huntington Surf and Sport and you got some floor space, um, it really helped open the door. So, um, so it was Billabong that wanted you to come work for them. Yeah, them, right? yeah. And so that's a natural progression it, for it, most pro surfers is to work for a, a retail brand. Yeah, and back in the you know uh, late '90s, early 2000s, which is this era we're talking about, um, you know, um, being a sales rep was like the dream post surfing you know i mean there was a lot of opportunity there it was just like you said a natural progression um 
you know, it fit really well with the whole, uh, the charisma and all of that stuff. Um, anyways, it just was a really natural thing for me to get into sales. And so, um, Ron Gould taught me a lot. I wasn't with Billabong very long as a sub rep. I was there with him for probably six months. And then, um, Rusty, um, had an Orange County, LA, uh, position open up to be the main rep. And, um, it wasn't doing, it wasn't, it wasn't on the same level as Billabong. Um, uh, but the opportunity to work with some of the accounts was something that, um, I wanted to, um, I really wanted to get under my belt. I wanted to work with some of these accounts. And, uh, I was taught at a young age that, you know, people aren't always going to remember you by the brand, but they're going to remember you, you know, for what you do and what you bring to the table. And so I took a leap of faith and, uh, and left Billabong, which I had been with for, um, probably seven or eight years at that time. And, uh, and went out on my own and it was, um, it was, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Um, when you mean out on your own, how do you mean? Well, because when you're a sub rep, you have a boss. Okay. Right. And when you have somebody like Ron Gould, who is one of the best in the industry, uh, mentoring you, um, there's so much value in that. Uh, but I, I just took, like I said, I just took a leap of faith and went out on my own. So here I am kind of my own boss, if you will. Um, and uh, I believe it or not, I was only with Rusty for like six months. And then the Hurley Orange County sales job opened up and uh, I got really lucky to be able to. Hurley now owned by Nike. Yeah. Now owned by uh, Blue Star. Um, I got really lucky to be able to take that job. And that was cool because that brought me back home. I was in Orange County working with uh, Huntington Surf and Sport and Jacks and Surfside Sports and felt like home frog house and yeah it was it was really really nice and hurley was an awesome company to work for um some amazing people there from bob hurley all the way down um you know and again i had another mentor there mark weber who i believe is at billabong now but that that was really neat um some great people there uh and so yeah i started again i did that you know um how did you find your way into becoming uh entrepreneur when did you find that you might want to make a, a leap and do something on your own? Cause you've built a very successful business. We're going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I cut my teeth at, at sales working for, um, those diff those companies. And, uh, uh, one of my partners, Russ Becker was, um, one of my partners in the, the company that I own Inc. Right. Um, he was working at Huntington Surf and Sport and he was doing all of their production and he, wanted to get into screen printing and after the financial crisis in 2008 um he bought a little hand press and put it in his garage and talked to aaron pie who's about the owner of, owners of yeah, uh, hss the owner of huntington surf and sport and talked to him about just doing some small little 24 unit runs um i don't think the world really knew what was going to happen in 2008 and so uh to be able to print 24 units and put it on the floor uh it was nice you didn't have to you know buy into the 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 deep volume that you would normally have to commit to and uh he was going to give that a year in his garage and he and i always wanted to work together and so i just i ended up quitting hurley um jumped in his garage and started pulling some screens and then um you know we talked to huntington surf and sport about you know hey if we wanted to give this a real go would you allow us to print all of your production and uh aaron pie being as awesome as he is um you know they yeah let it rip and so we went and uh put a business plan together went and borrowed some money from a family member and uh uh moved into a small little production facility in north huntington and and started the screen print business and uh my first three phone calls were to billabong quicksilver and hurley and uh all three of them laughed you know like do you even know what you're doing and i'm like it's my partner russ and i like what do you mean like give us some business we'll learn are you even compliant like what's compliance it's my <laughs> partner russ and i and, uh, and they just said just we love you danny um stay in touch with us and uh and let us know how things go and so it's interesting because every time we got a new job and we were learning how to like print, you know, um, I would call uh, Dwight Dunn over at Hurley and I'd be like, I've got this six color job and I need to, 
figure out how to uh, print it good. And he's like, I've never actually printed a shirt, Danny, but if you have the right opacity in the inks and you have the right squeegee at the right angle, uh, you'll get a good print, right? And, uh, and so anyways, I just kind of kept those relationships going and, um, three years into our business, we had moved into, um, a bigger facility and, um, had really gotten ourselves grounded and structured. And I called the guys at Hurley and said, look, I think you guys really got to come down here and check this out. I mean, we could be a great compliment to, um, your inline production by doing a lot of your marketing stuff. And, uh, so you stayed on them. You stayed on. You let them know that you're starting to grow and you're starting to learn some things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just, yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they were a huge part of our growth, whether they knew it or not, because, you know, I did, I just stayed in touch with them and, um, they knew our progress. So anyways, they came down, uh, they were owned by Nike at the time and they said, Hey, shop looks great. We, we could totally use you on a marketing level. Um, but we can't approve you as a vendor. You have to go through Nike and get audited and certified and this and that. And so. But what a great opportunity, right? Yeah. That makes you get, that means you have to tighten up the ship, grow up, um, operationalize, systematize, right? Document. 100%. And so they did, right? And so Nike has a third party auditing company and um, they sent an auditor down and we went through the process and we got certified. And they came down, the whole Nike crew or the whole Hurley crew came down and was just like, how did you guys pass the first time? And, uh, we were just fortunate to have some things buttoned up and that kind of opened the door for us. And that, you know, being a three-year-old company, getting Nike certified, um, it did, we grew up quick. That's awesome. If I could take a real quick step back with you, um, you and your buddy starting a screen printing in a garage, Mm -hmm. right? In 2008, you're married, right? Did you have kids at this time? Uh, yeah, yeah. It was closer to 2009 and Ava, my oldest daughter was just born. So yeah, I took another huge leap of faith because I left Hurley, um, which I was an employee of at the time helping, um, run the U S open and the Hurley pro. And so there was benefits, um, all that stuff, but I just needed a change. I was kind of going through some other things in my life. It wasn't, it was a dark time in my life and, um, change was the only thing that I could feel inside. And, uh, and so, yeah, so took that leap of faith again. (laughs) I think that's where a lot of folks, um, want to ask questions. They want to know how the thought process was, right. And what was going on in your head. Um, most people sit on a a job with benefits and a family and, uh, but they might have an idea or a passion for a a company or something they want to do on uh, maybe even on the side at first. It's a hard hard step to make that step. You burned the ships, quit the job and started a new business. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, look at that point in my life, um, things were really dark. Um, I was hitting the bottom, if you will. Um, and, uh, whether I was, I don't, maybe I wasn't clear. Um, and, and I was just kind of like going by feelings or whatever, but I, I just, I did it, you know, it's a feeling, you know, Russ and I had always wanted to work together. And that was one of those things that I was like, let's do this. Um, you know, when we got to that three-year point and we were going through the audit process with um, with Nike, we had brought another partner on Bobby Knutson and, uh, we had brought him on because Russ and I were wearing so many hats and it was just a matter of time before we were going to make a mistake. And so Bobby came in, he was very structured from an operational standpoint. Um, you know, I had the relationships outside to bring sales in. Russ had all the, um, the creative talent around, you know, um, art and separations and ink and being able to make a good print. And Bobby had, uh, a lot of the operational skills to like square us up, build systems and, uh, and create something sustainable. So that, that really was our, that was a huge intersection point for us that, you know, took us to that next level where, you know, we had, um, four or five years in a row of like 200% growth year over year and moving, wow. moving buildings and 
What's the business look like today? Um, yeah, so we've been in business for, this year will be 13 years. Um, we're a you know, well-established um, garment decorator here in Huntington Beach. Um, How many employees? We got 80, we got 80 employees. Uh, we have some great relationships in the action sports industry, the outdoor industry, and some major retailers. Bunch of facilities. Uh, we've got uh, two facilities. Um, 30,000 square feet total. And, uh, you know, we have survived COVID. Um, we are, you know, being a domestic manufacturer, we're highly susceptible to the, you know, the, the market headwinds and the things that are going on in the economy. But um, we've got really talented people and, you know, quality and service is you know the backbone of kind of who we are and so um we've got some great relationships and some really good customers congratulations on that danny that's uh that's not just a, a generic accolade that's a big deal um i'm very passionate about people following uh their gut and their feelings around um business and i think that uh, you're a prime example of what that looks like when it can when it can work out yeah um, well I'm, and again it comes back to having Again, it, I go, there's this theme of mentors, right? Um, and we've been fortunate to have some really special mentors in our corner that have been very successful in business at the highest level. And so every every step of the way, every obstacle, hurdle, tailwind, headwind, whatever it is, we've had some really powerful people to lean on and share their experience and and help us get through it. And um, I think that's what's helped us keep this kind of like unwavering, like faith that, you know, we will prevail and, you know, um, make the adjustments necessary when, you know, you've got a state that is, um, making it tough to do business. Sure. California is very tough to do business in. Um, and Danny, you, you constantly have a theme around, um, giving props to the people that help you, right? You call them mentors in your life and people that come into your life and help you out there. Um, it's evident. I know you well. I know these people around you, but you surround yourself and you attract these people in in your life, right? Both business and philanthropy that we're going to talk about here now. And so that says a lot about you in my world um, that you're able to attract these people and take advice and do. And it's no, uh, it's no coincidence. That's the testament to your success with Incry. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, I was someone my my father-in-law said this years ago because i i asked him what what is it like being the smartest man in the room and he just looked at me with just and he was like what he goes i'm not i'm like probably the least smart you know the the i've always been fortunate to be able to surround myself with people smarter than me and and people that are great teammates because collectively right you can achieve your goal and your mission. Right. And that, that really stuck out to me because to me, he's always been, you know, like the, the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I've learned a lot from him over the years. You know, what, what I've really learned is that there's some people in this world that carry really special energy and that special energy harmonizes and tracks others. And when you can bring that energy together and, and you can get focused on a, a common goal or a purpose, um, you just let everybody do what they do and magic happens. That's the formula. That's how it works. That's how it works for lots of folks is to surround yourself with the right people, um, not be the smartest guy, but to have the brightest people around on your team, right? And know when to take advice and know when to take action yeah. and get after it. Um, that's fantastic, Danny. What we're here to talk about is uh, open water, really, is well the reason why I wanted to have this podcast. And um, I want to give the folks a little bit of background on how um, Mike got uh, introduced here, if you will. And so um, give you guys a little background. Last year, uh, middle of the year, one of my goals, if you looked at or listened to the 2022 goal planning uh, session that I had with Dave Rhodes, we talked about our goal for the year, which was a channel crossing, which is a Catalina Island, which is off the coast of California here. It's about 22 miles, by the way, the crow flies. Um, 30 some miles to Huntington Beach, 33 to be exact. Um, there's a crossing that people do on paddle boards or canoes or kayaks or, or, swim. or swim or watercraft, if you will. 
And uh, my buddy Dave and I had made a goal to do it. I had done it some times before, but there's logistics involved. You need a crew, you need boats, and you need people to help you, and there's some logistics. And so um, we were trying to organize some logistics, and somebody said, hey, you might want to go talk to Danny. He's got a, um, a charity that's going on, and they're going to be doing a, a, a ocean crossing. So I went and got an introduction to Danny, and... Um, uh, asked if I could get a ride as <laughs> selfishly if I could get a ride and hey I'm willing to help and do whatever I can to help out uh, if you can give us a ride over to the island so we can paddle back with all y'all and uh, what ended up happening was I got introduced to open water which is an unbelievable uh, waterman's uh, charity uh, for first responders and for veterans and I want to tell you guys all about it because I think um, without a doubt there's a, a, a systemic problem going on in our society and in our world around mental health uh, it's by all means and by all accounts a crisis and in this uh, individual area both first responders um, firefighters and police and and people of that nature as well as veterans uh, it's it's astonishing some of the numbers uh, that are being touted um, a quick look on the internet uh, showed that 125,000 um, veterans have committed suicide since 2001 that average is out to 15 and a half a day if you do the math that's Un unbelievable. I don't know if that's ever happened in our history, um, but it is what it is right now. And so, Danny, tell us about Open Water and what it is you're trying to accomplish. Uh, yeah. So, Operation Open Water um, started as a concept on Veterans Day 2019. Uh, Kyle Kelly, who's our co founder, and I, um, we met some years prior volunteering and participating for another organization that was teaching surfing to wounded veterans. And um, Kyle and I just hit it off. Um, we just, it was just like a, a kindred spirit from the beginning. And, uh, you know, our family has uh, a ranch in Texas and Kyle mm -hmm. was living in Northeast Texas at the time. And so we would get together every year on Thanksgiving and, you know, fish and hunt hogs and, um, you know, just talk about life. And we come from two completely different backgrounds. You know, I grew up, I was a surfer. I was fortunate to be able to do that as the a beach life, as a career. Right. Um, but surfing in the ocean was something that saved my life, you know, time and time again, it was like the one place that I could go to where I could just surrender. Right. Um, and for Kyle, you know, uh, being in, you know, Northeast Texas, you know, he was on this, uh, career path to be, you know, in the military and, uh, and he wanted to retire. Um, he wanted that to be his career until retirement and, um, some, you know, <laughs> some things happen and, uh, and he had to medically retire. Um, he was part of, um, he was part of um, some pretty significant battles when he was deployed in Iraq, Battle of Bakuba, um, to, to be exact. And there's actually a book written on that that I'll go into detail about that particular battle. But Kyle was right in the middle of that. And, um, you know, he, he took a pretty significant blast and, um, you know, limb salvage, uh, ended up getting his, um, his leg amputated below his knee and, um, you know, suffered a traumatic brain injury and, uh, anyways, like our, our unique experiences in our life had kind of brought us to like that point, you know, and here we are two completely different people, but we shared this like common bond of, um, you know, like recovery, you know, not like in like the 12 step way, but just like, Hey man, like we've got shit and like, what do we do about it? Right. Type of thing. And, uh, at that time he and I had both formed some relationships with um, some first responders and we just had this like aha moment of like wow you know there's 40,000 nonprofit organizations that are serving veterans and there's so much help out there for veterans between you know the VA the the, the private sector um, but what we saw was that there there wasn't um, a whole lot of resources and support there for our first responders and I think the last 20 years of war have really kind of teed 
some people up to be able to say that it's okay to not be okay, right? And to address, you know, mental health and, you know, the depression, the PTS and, and, and some of those things. Um, but we, we, you know, saw that that same stress over stimulation and trauma that our military and veterans have faced, our first responders are facing day in and day out for a 15, 30 year career. And uh, for Kyle and I at that time in our life, like we were just not into the, the labeling and the, the stigma and, you know, the, the victimization of, you know, mental health. Dude, we all got mental health issues. I don't care if you serve on our front lines or if you're a teacher or whatever the heck it is, like we all have stuff, right? But the bigger question is, what are we doing about it, right? Like, what are we doing to focus more on the mental wellness side of things, right? And so Veterans Day 2019, <clears throat> we uh, we said, let's do, let's, let's cross the channel. Let's paddle from, you know, Catalina to Huntington. Kyle's only experience with the ocean at that point had been um, surfing small waves, right? And uh, me growing up as a surfer, I, I've always felt like surfing is just that entry point to um, something much deeper, which I think resonates in the, in, in that waterman, you know, mindset of mind, body, and spirit, right? It's mm -hmm. that ethos. And, um, what better way to surrender than to put yourself out in the middle of the ocean where you realize how insignificant you are and how small you are and you're faced with fear and uncertainty and all these things and you have no control over the elements can't control the wind can't control the, the tides right you can't control these things so you you you, you have to surrender all of that and the only thing that you can control is your attitude and your actions and we really felt that that was such a, a pivotal point in this shift right towards mental wellness and um the ability to control your actions, <clears throat> control what you can control. Yeah. And, uh, and make positive strides. Right. Um, and so we, we did the crossing on veterans day in 2019. There was 11 of us. We had a couple police officers from Huntington beach PD. Uh, we had a couple watermen out there, a couple veterans, Marine safety officers. And, uh, the success of that crossing was the springboard for us to pursue being a nonprofit organization. Um, when we finished that crossing, um, you know, Kyle and I and a couple others uh, just kind of took it a step farther and just said, well, what else do we like to do that works, you know? And so while we were getting the corporate structure in place, and when you talk about mentors, right? Like, um, you know, we've had, we have some very powerful mentors in our corner on the nonprofit side. And, um, one of our board members being Mary Lou Shattuck, who, um, has been doing, um, nonprofit work for 35 years. And when we got to this point of wanting to do it, she was like the first person to call, Hey, we need help. Mm -hmm. Right. This is what we want to do. And um, her, so, her, so what was the goal at this point? You you raised awareness by doing a channel crossing. You put the network out. You found all your buddies that were able to help come do some support. You talked to the lifeguards and they are willing to come uh, chaperone and and run crew for you and things like that because they think it's a good cause. But but what was really the, well, the thought process when you were starting the nonprofit? I, I don't I don't know. I mean, it's a fellowship. I I, I, I don't <clears throat> At the time, I don't think we really had a clear picture on like, you know, what is this nonprofit going to be, mm -hmm. right? Um, we that's that's the answer I was looking for. So <laughs> I want to get this out there to everybody again. Don't miss this detail. Just yeah. do it, right? Yeah. It is now formulated into a very, um, a, a very formal scenario here with this this. Um, open water. However, it started as a, we don't know what we want to do exactly, but we were going to do it. And we're going to start with a channel crossing and we're going to get some awareness out and we're going to figure it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and the, now the, you have the some, thing, the thing, the thing that really like water is the medium that brings us together. Right. And those really powerful elements were the veteran community, the first responder community and the local community. Right. Uh, water is just the medium. You know, you bring those three 
elements together and you really start to humanize what's going on, right? And when you can start to humanize what's going on, you can start to create a level of compassion and empathy for um, everything, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and for us, that, to, uh, for us, that's like the healing on the inside out, mm-hmm. right? And so you have some core tenets uh, of what you do, right? It's a unique training program, fellowship, and open water uh, experiences. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so our, our mission is to uh, support the health and wellness of every veteran and first responders through unique training programs, fellowship, and open water experiences. And um, today, you know, we have three pillars. Uh, we have our transformational breathwork pillar. We've been really fortunate to be able to uh, partner up and work with Shift Adapt, Brian McKenzie and Emily Hightower. Um, these are two brilliant human health performers in the um, space of um, breath work, um, stress physiology, um, and really uh, rehabilitation from that, that physiological side, right? Sure. Um, and- These folks teach the underwater training, breath works, pool works, right? You do weights on the fl- on the on the pool floor. Yeah, so that's a, do- that's another part. That's another piece of it. Um, so you know, Brian, um, you know, Brian McKenzie's uh, got his art of breath seminar. Um, as well as his mentorship and, uh, you know, it's shift adapt company, uh, Emily Hightower, um, created skill of stress, which is just about, which is really about, um, stress physiology and learning how to down regulate and kind of repattern some of the neurological centers that might have experienced trauma. Mm-hmm. Right. So we don't have to identify with the trauma. We can release it and let it go. And, um, continue forward. Uh, drop Mor- the rock. Drop the say. rock. Yeah. Morgan Hostery, who's one of our head coaches at Open Water. Um, she's a, uh, she is an elite water men, water woman in, in her own right. Um, she has a uh, waterlogged adventures. And so she teaches all of our CO2 tolerance training in pools, right? So it's all basic free dive. Um, application so we can take we can take what we're learning on land and then we can also apply this in water you know you get yourself in an environment like water where again you have no control over the elements um you know co2 is a really important thing for uh recovery and um longevity of health and so we we do we focus a lot on that with our transformational breathwork courses Uh, We have our water experiences, which is more uh, inclusive of the community. It's very outreach, fundraisers, waterman training, waterman workouts, um, stuff like that. You do the annual Rusty Anchor every year. Yeah. And so that's part of our 301 uh, active mentorship. The Rusty Anchor is the channel crossing. That's the name uh, for the channel crossing. And it's um, got a lot of pomp and circumstance. You know, this last year we had um you know firefighters and we had lifeguards and we had uh veterans and we had special teams members and we had all of these folks go on veterans day cross across the channel and stop and have a ceremony in the middle of the catalina channel in the middle of the ocean um after a very hard morning i might add we had some wind in the morning that we did not expect which again you can't control mother nature you can't control the mother ocean she takes control um but we survived and we were midday um and we did a drop the rock ceremony out there mm-hmm. right tell us about that uh, yeah so veterans day is on 11 11 and so we kyle and i you know and we just felt like it would be really cool to circle up in the middle of the channel at 11 11 on 11 11 and uh and in, in, in say a few things and um, everyone has a little rock on them and we just drop the rock, which just drop a challenge in your life. And it's a very spiritual experience when you're in the middle of the ocean. Um, it was powerful. It's powerful. And you're pretty exhausted at that point. You know, we're, we're close to 19 miles in of a 33 mile paddle. And so it's a great place to stop and get re-inspired and realize that what we're doing is bigger than us. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm learning a lot about, um, about this. And so for the folks that are here, you're thinking, um, 
first responders and vets, yeah, they deal with a lot of stress, right? And they and they deal with a lot of uh, trauma in their day, right? But I'm learning more and more. And Danny, why don't you give us a little more background? I mean, I've heard Kevin give me some physiological descriptions of cortisol in the brain and rapid dumps of that. You know, he was on special teams and also in the uh, a career uh, firefighter. So he's dealt with that um, on has the physiological um issues that come along with that, right? And it's a physiological issue that turns into a mental issue, right? Yeah, well, um, stress is stress, right? Um, Viktor Frankl, uh, there's stimulus and there's response. And in the middle of that, there's this little space and that's the choice, right? And so, again, stress is stress doesn't it it's not necessarily bad but it's how we respond to it right and um, for a lot of our frontline workers you know you're dealing with a level of hyper vigilance um, and you're dealing with you know uh, a high level of activity um, so you're always revved right and you know when you're when you're always revved like that, you know, your physiology, your autonomic nervous system, you're running very sympathetic, right? And so over time, what happens is your window of tolerance, your window of tolerance tends to shrink, right? And so um, when you're operating between the, the window of tolerance, uh, it might feel weird because you're used to a more hypervigilant um, mode of operation, right? And so when you don't have that like you get off work or you come back from a mission or whatever uh your body needs to recover and sometimes it drops into a really deep parasympathetic state and there's a lot of misunderstanding around that because sometimes we tend to think that something is wrong with us because we can't get motivated to do certain things or whatever it is or uh simple little things like engaging with like the family can be kind of tough but really it's just the autonomic nervous system your physiology just saying time out i need to recover um and so again this goes back to what brian mckenzie and emily hightower are teaching is they're they're teaching us a lot about um that window of tolerance and our autonomic nervous system and stress physiology in general right and you know sympathetic and parasympathetic states and um, so relevant to the communities that we serve because, you know, there is a level of hypervigilance that is constantly releasing chemicals in the brain, whether it's serotonin, dopamine, cortisol, whatever it is. Um, and so you get too much of a chemical depletion and, uh, yeah, you can drop into a parasympathetic state say, or get depressed or some of these other things. Think about, um, you know, the firefighter, right? So they get the alarm, they get in the, they get in the truck, the engine, they're heading to a scene, they're seeing some trauma, right? Um, they're dealing with trauma, they pack up, they go back to the fire station, right? And then they have it down, they get to come back down for a moment, then they get about back up, and they don't know when they're gonna get back up, and they're back up for a while. And they do this for, you know, days at a time, and then they come back home where there's very, a lot less stress right? If you will, on that level. So very different. Think of a police officer, police officers going on a scene. Every time a police officer is engaged with the with yeah. a public, he's on alert, right? And so they have to deal with that. And you think military and, and veterans um, away from their families dealing with life and death situations. It's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. And just a disclaimer, you know, I, I do not serve in the military. And, you know, I, I have not served as a first responder, either law enforcement or fire. Um, you know, I am uh, I am part of the community here with this organization. Right. And, my, you know, coming from the waterman side of things, you know, I, I get to play a pretty specific role. But, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to operate really closely with these individuals and they have. Um, not only shared their experience, I've got to witness um, the experience. So, um, you know, I'm while I'm not speaking from experience here, I am speaking from what I feel is a very knowledgeable place. And, 
you know, when, when you're dealing with law enforcement, um, you know, from the second they clock in, there's a level of hypervigilance there that at any moment they're going to get a call and you never know what kind of call you're going to show up on, you know? And so that mentality of always ready to go is right. Pinning you at the top of that window of tolerance. Right. And when you're dealing with uh, fire, um, you know, you're dealing with, like you said, the, the spikes, you know, like there's downtime and then there's the call. And then um, sometimes you get, you know, multiple, multiple back to back to back to back to back calls. Right. And so it's again, it's that same level of hypervigilance where you're always going. And um, sleep is one of those things that is tough to regulate. You know, um, and that is, I think sleep is probably an epidemic um, because that can really mess up your hormones and, and a lot of things, right? Um, and I think it's a thankless job. You know, I, I, I don't, they would never, uh, I don't know, I can't speak for them, but I know that when I say, hey, thank you for your service, you know, to fire and law enforcement, they just look at me like, just doing my job, you know, like, and, and a lot of that energy gets pushed to our military, which rightfully so, you know, thank you to our military for your service. You know, you have a, a, a group over here that's, you know, serving your country. And then you have a group over here that's serving your community. And then what I feel is our role, mine and yours being civilians, you know, we get to turn around and serve them. Right. And so it is very holistic. Um, and it's pretty amazing. And I've got to tell you, the folks I've interacted with, um, there's kind of a, a rope to dope going on too. And some of the folks that we get to come volunteer, if you will, to help out, right? Yeah. Some of the first responders that will come and say, I'm I'm okay. I'm happy to help you guys out. If yeah. you guys need some help, we'll come run a crew or what have you. But when I interact with those folks, they're getting a lot out of it. Yeah. They they get uh, an immense amount out of helping and serving. They also get an immense amount out of the workouts because these are very um, strenuous. These are very uh, enduring. There's a lot of endurance involved. There's a, there's a lot to what we do. Yeah. The fel the fellowship is really the, the key here because um, – Everybody is serving on some level, right? And I, I think that, you know, these individuals aren't signing up for these lucrative paychecks. They're serving up because they believe in something bigger than themselves, right? And I, I feel like that's what one of the things that resonates really well with what Open Water is doing because we kind of bleed that same ethos. Um, and what's cool is we're working on the solution, right? Like, sure, we can get together and we can take the mask off real quick and talk about, you know, the stuff that's going on. But more importantly, which is a very common thread at Open Water is uh, we're doing something about it, you know, and I, I feel like that's something that's really attractive because, uh, again, this goes back to what Kyle and I were talking about at the beginning, you know, like we all have stuff, you know, like we're not here to victimize, stigmatize or, you know, label individuals who are doing a very important job in our community in our country we're here to say hey we know you guys are working your butts off the only way we can pay you back and, and thank you for your service is to provide unique training programs fellowship and open water experiences that like really promote the wellness side of things and can help balance the stress and overstimulation that these individuals deal with, yep. you know? And so what does open water look like? It looks like uh, uh, activities, events. Um, we've got things on the calendar. Uh, for example, uh, uh, upcoming here on Memorial Day, there's going to be a, a paddleboard race and a chili cook-off here that's a fundraiser at the Newport Aquatic Center. Um, I'm sure we're going to raise a boatload of money for, for the charity during, doing this. Um, there are Waterman Wednesdays. I mean, yeah. Tell so, us about your East Coast team. Yeah. So, so we, so we offer, um, we offer transformational breathwork programs, art of breath, skill of stress, and waterlogged, and those are all free for veterans and first responders, and they're all various forms of advanced CO two tolerance training and. Um, uh, uh, 
geez, sorry, I'm just drawing a blank. Um, tool, tools around stress physiology, right? right. Like, hey, if you're going to be... Things that people can take with them. Things that, yeah, tools that people can take with them. Um, down regulation tools, recovery tools, active recovery stuff. Um, just additional tools for their tool bag, right? So when they're working, they can kick in any one of these breath work protocols or um, down regulation, um, meditative like um, breath work practices that can, um, you know, help you like Neuro Nidra, right? Uh, you know, Huberman's talking about non sleep Andrew deep Huberman. Andrew Huberman's talking about non sleep deep rest. Emily Hightower uh, has created a neuro nidra, which is um, a very similar form of being able to shut down, meditate, body scan. And there's science backing this stuff that, you know, with a 20 to 25 minute just shut down and body scan and breath work, you know, you can, um, you know, recoup some hours of lost sleep. You know, and so while these individuals are working, you know, these are tools where it's like, hey, take 20 minutes out of your day, just shut down, right? Just close your eyes, meditate, do a body scan, follow this little pattern or whatever your heart desires. Uh, but it's really important that people start to, um, these people give themselves the opportunity to do some of these things, right? And so we're, we're focused really hard on um, giving these individuals some of these additional tools that will help them perform at the level that they're performing at for much longer. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the, like you said, we have, um, we have a satellite operation in North Carolina, uh, Jake Green, who's one of our board members. He was mentored across our Veterans Day Channel Crossing by Kyle year two. So in 2020, Jake came out and did it. And in 21, Jake came back with a team of five. And then last year, 2022, North Carolina came out with a crew of nine. And we had an individual from Virginia and we had an individual from Michigan, along with our whole West Coast crew. Uh, so you can see this force multiplier of um, veterans and first responders kind of mentoring each other. And, and bringing their own, right? Yeah. Bringing their friends that need some need some, uh, some outlets. Yeah. In, in, uh it's really cool to see what North Carolina is doing. And, um, it's really awesome for our organization because we're starting to scale and, um, we're learning how to do that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, it's really exciting because there's some amazing people over there that are just, this, they're just awesome. The folks that I've met so far, uh, like Kevin, for example, and, and, and others that far more knowledgeable about, um, the issues and the communities that we're serving um, are are inspirational to me in their their vigor for what we're doing, right? And so it, I I like you. Other than being a lifeguard for several years, I um I have no experience being a first responder, and I was never a vet. And so um, I don't know what it is. I'm I'm here to help by you know being the guy to help lead into workout. Right, carry I'm here the message. The, that's right. Carry the message. Uh, to go volunteer to get some fundraising. Whatever it takes to do what I can do to help out, we're we're doing that. But what I'm hearing from the vets is this is very meaningful work, and they're taking tools with them from these breathworks classes and these these other tools you're talking about. Um, it's inspiring. It's amazing, and um, we've got many events on the calendar, right? Yeah, that yeah. So uh, May May sixth, we have our um, Lake to Lake paddle in North Carolina, uh, Lake Tillery. Um, that is to help the East Coast crew raise money to come out uh, to participate in the Rusty Anchor twelve week program, which is uh, Lake Tahoe to Catalina. Um, and then on May 28th, we have our Newport Aquatic Center uh, Memorial Day paddle slash chili cook-off. Um, so those are two great fundraising opportunities where open water can engage with the community, uh, raise awareness, and um, raise some funds to help send veteran, veterans and first responders through the, the Rusty Anchor program and to participate in the transformational breathwork courses. Um, 9-11, we have our honor challenge. That's uh, an honor challenge that uh, we created to never forget what happened on 9-11. Uh, 
Tell us about that challenge. Tell us what's involved in that, that honor challenge. Yeah. So, uh, again, you know, uh, Kyle and I thinking about the significance of certain dates, you know, like our channel crossing is on veterans day. Um, our honor challenge is on nine 11 and, uh, you know, our, our paddle is on Memorial day, right? These are really significant dates for, um, us as individuals and, and us that have, um, had, uh, you know, family serve. Um, and I think for our nation in general, I mean, gosh, our whole world, 9-11, right? And Memorial Day. What do you do on Veterans 9-11? Day. What do you so do we, do, we do an honor challenge. So we honor the numbers of 9-11. And um, so we do uh, uh, 110 flights of stairs. Um, which is mocking the Twin Towers, right? Yep, which is synonymous with 9-11, uh, the, the Twin Towers. We do, uh, gosh, man, I'm putting me on the spot. I got to do some rope carries for the firefighters, <laughs> right? They're carrying... Um, yeah we do uh hose or coast carries i mean yeah i'm just uh i'm so sorry i'm like having a space right now so we do 60 burpees uh to represent law enforcement and port authority officers that were um that died that day uh we do 44 push-ups to represent the passengers on united flight 93 uh, we do a 2,763 yard run to represent the people in the World Trade Center. 110 flights of stairs was synonymous with climbing. Um, yep, the towers. Uh, 189 second plank uh, to represent the people, the Pentagon. Uh, and a 343 yard fire hose drag um, represents our uh, firefighters and EMS service personnel. Right. And so it's a great community event. Um, it sounds like a pretty daunting workout but we do it in a in a challenge format so you you take those numbers and you break them down over uh five laps so you do like a we in in huntington we um we uh, partnered with huntington beach high school and we do it at their football stadium and so we utilize the track and the bleachers and the whole deal and uh we'll do our warm-up lap and then we'll do our five challenge laps and then we'll do our cool down lap and there's a really beautiful ceremony to um to kick it off and Kane Johnson, who's uh, one of our ambassadors, and he's a um, paramedic and engineer for Huntington Beach Fire. He's our MC, um, and he's got a one heck of a mustache, by the way. He's got one heck of a mustache. Um, yeah, it's it's really cool. Again, it's a it's a it's a uh, it's an opportunity to bring the community together, you know, for something bigger than ourselves. You give it awareness by doing it. You get the word out by doing it. Um, there's training involved, right? So the folks that want to do it, the, the first responders and people, um, the vets, they get a chance to come train, work out regularly, which is very healthy for, for folks that are, that are having stress issues, um, as well as corporate sponsorships. We raise money. You have the ability to then take some of that money and use it. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's the goal, right? Um, awareness and um an opportunity you know i mean i we 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 want to serve every veteran and first responder in in the united states and uh the cool thing is is water is the medium that brings us together so you know we we do have an opportunity to 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 bring this to every community and uh yeah i mean that's our that's it's a perfect example of one of the events that we do. And so, um, Danny, I'm super, super excited for, for what's going on here. We've got a, um, uh, the next one on the docket here, I think, is um, uh, here in Newport is the chili cook-off and paddle race. There's a four-mile fun paddle. Um, we just broke out from uh, before, right before this podcast. We're sitting in Danny's office slash van. Um uh, at the beach here, uh, we had a board meeting with some uh, executives here taking some doo-doos and being very professional about how we're going about uh, taking our list of things to do. But on Memorial Day, um, looking forward to driving some attendance and getting the right folks here and raising some money for uh, for the cause. Yeah, and it's going to be really neat because, you know, we we have the paddle for those that want to get on the water and, and either enjoy the paddle or race. And then we have the chili cook-off, which I think is really fun, family-oriented. Um, I'm sure there'll be some bragging rights and some some fun competition. But yeah, that's at the Newport Aquatic Center on May 28th. 
That's great. So um, if people want to get involved and everybody knows somebody who is a vet, everybody knows somebody who's a first responder uh, and or a retired first responder, um, I haven't had a single post or um, uh, on social uh, that I haven't gotten somebody come back to me with, this is a great cause. What can people do? Uh, yeah, people can go to our website, operationopenwater.org. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you, you, there's uh, different ways you can support donating um, whether, uh, you are able to donate some money to help, or if you'd like to volunteer, um, you can find all that information on our website. If you want to follow us along on Instagram, our Instagram's, um, at be open water, be open water, be open water, um, mm -hmm. B E open water. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Get involved. Help yeah. us out, please. Appreciate it. Danny, um, you know, this is, a. a very serendipitous kind of, uh, in my personal opinion, uh, relationship that we have. I, I, um, I knew I, I, I knew I should have known you for a long time for the people that we know each other, right? We know all these different folks here in, in town. Um, but I'm super excited to, to be a part of open water and help out in any way I can. I think that, um, this is bringing awareness to something that a lot of people know, you know, high level, but they don't know how they can help, right? What what can I do in that scenario? Um, but the scenario is enable folks to be able to deal with stress, right? By providing environments that give them an opportunity to work on these tools, learn the tools, work out with other individuals, right? Learn the ocean or, or a lake or other open uh, water uh, environments. And um, it's very therapeutic in this environment, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you just nailed it, you know, uh, nature fellowship. Yep. Right. With a con with a common bond to, uh, focus on solution. Yep. My favorite part is that fellowship piece in the workout, right? I love, uh, Waterman Wednesdays. We get an opportunity to go, um, canoe, kayak, stand up paddleboard, do these kinds of things. And, and not everyone has to know how to do it. Most of the folks have never done it before and trying it and learning it. And then all of a sudden they, you know, like most folks, they get addicted to it. They like it a lot and they end up, uh, becoming water, water people. Yeah. Yep. Well, cool. Danny, you're an example, uh, entrepreneur, father, uh, Waterman, the kind of guy I want to hang out with. And, uh, the, you know, we, we blazed over your success of, of Ink Right. That's a, a testament to, you know, doing things on, on gut instinct and having the right people, um, seeking the right people around you to do things. Um, open water is exactly the same. You, you got in, you got busy. Uh, you thought about the details later. Uh, you surround yourself with some good people. The momentum gets built and all of a sudden you have some phenomenal people around you helping with the cause. So I want people to understand the value of jumping in and, and getting after things. Um, any thoughts on, on on that last that last plug, Danny? No, I mean I I mean I'm look I'm just grateful for where I'm at today and and the people that are around me. You know, I mean I'm honestly I'm really just like a reflection of like all the people that have been in my life and um, are 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 a part of this thing because it is it's something bigger than ourselves, right? And yeah, let's go. Let's go. All right, everybody, go, go pull up uh, openwater.org or uh, be open water on uh, Instagram. O Operation Open Water. Operation Open Water. Yeah. Um, or be open water on Instagram yeah. and uh, go check it out. Hope all's, uh, hope you like this for this podcast. Please share it with your friends. And uh, thank you, Danny. Yeah, I appreciate you all. Thank you. Hey, Mike here. Hope you like this boardroom session. Please check back to your future sessions as we're recording a new one every month. If you want to reach out, look for me on LinkedIn or send me a note at mike at sidepath.com. That's mike at S-I-D-E-P-A-T-H dot com.